The guest for this episode is Brian Robert Moore. He spoke about his stint in Italy as a publisher and editor and his translation of the beautiful short story collection You Bleeding Childhood written by the great Italian author Michele Mari. Brian Robert Moore is a literary translator originally from New York City. His published and forthcoming translations from Italian include A Meeting in Positano by Goliatta Sapienza, A Silence Shared by Lalla Romano, and You Bleeding Childhood and Verticris by Michele Mari. His translations of shorter works have appeared in 3 AM magazine, Asymptote, The Nation, The Poetry Review and elsewhere. His translation of Michele Mari's story, The Black Arrow, has won the O. Henry Prize for Short Story for the year 2023. He has also won the 2021 Penn Grant for the English translation of Italian literature and was selected for a translation residency at the Casa delle Tradugioni in Rome. After receiving degrees from Brown University in BA Comparative Literature and Italian Studies, and Trinity College Dublin M Phil in Irish writing he worked for several years in Italian publishing including as an editor of literary fiction in translation you can buy you bleeding childhood using the link given in the show notes you may please give your feedback on this episode using spotify and apple podcasting apps welcome to our podcast friend thank you very much for coming over Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. How did you get into translating Italian? So, I started studying both Italian and translation while I was in college, though it wasn't what I had gone to college to study specifically. And I had already been very interested in Italian culture, especially because of Italian film. and i studied abroad while in college in bologna those years really solidified my love of the language and the culture and i after graduating and then doing a masters i moved to milan to work in publishing and to milan specifically because that's really the heart of publishing in italy so while i hadn't necessarily been planning to focus on translation when i moved there and i ended up working in in publishing in various editorial capacities one of the first things i did maybe the first work i found was doing translation samples for publishers for the rights departments essentially because not many people across the world generally speaking can really read italian whereas English is is very helpful for selling rights. So I would do these samples for for a whole range of different genres which was very helpful for trying out different kinds of work, different styles. And when I eventually moved back to the United States in 20 the end of 2019, I had already been hoping for a long time to do a a full length translation. none of the samples that i'd done not none of those books had actually sold in english speaking territories so that didn't happen but when i moved back i did a sample for other press for guillardo sapienza's meeting in positano which they had already acquired and they liked my translation enough to let me translate the whole book and so that was my first book length translation and since then i've really been focusing on authors who whose work I love and I've been trying to find essentially anglophone homes for their work. How did you arrive at uh, publishing brain? And importantly, what's your journey as a reader? It, while I was in college, I thought I would work in publishing or that was my my hope after doing a couple of internships and at the same time my my interest in Italian literature was growing. So I, it's almost accidental that I found a way to converge these two things. It wasn't something I necessarily thought about too much. And I guess one thing I liked while I was working in Italy was working with authors who were not Italian. Actually, I was for a while. I worked as an editor of foreign fiction and translation, so fiction that was not Italian. 
and discovered authors who I still whose work I still really love, who whose work I've then worked on in Italy, such as one author, Sanjeev Sahoda, who's actually so of, in, of Indian descent, who has written the book I worked on there, The Year of the Runaways, is largely set in India, about half of it's set in India. That's one of my favorite contemporary books still. Some of these authors were from the Anglosphere, and I liked, and I continued to straddling two different worlds in my work. Now that I'm working with Anglophone publishers, I love to still feel immersed with Italian literature, Italian culture. So it's a kind of, it's the opposite of what I was doing before. But I've, I've generally enjoyed splitting my focus between two languages and two publishing industries, you could say. And in terms of where I come from as a reader, that's something also I've thought about a lot more because of Mari, because some of his, his books are... A lot of his books, and in particular the ones that I've translated so far, deal with his childhood and literary influences that begin in his childhood. And that has really brought me back to where my love of storytelling comes from. Some of the overlap is very um, literal, you could say. His love of kind of spooky stories, ghost stories, things like that. That that stuff I really did love as a child. And his books have brought me back to that initial love. And I've been tapping into those emotions again through his work. Then I did really love books and stories as a child. Now there's YA and that whole genre of books for young adults. And it, I don't know if it was called that then. I don't think it was really being called YA then. I, there was nothing as a kind of preteen and early teen that really gripped me for a period of time. And then in I became, I was born as a serious reader in high school when I fell in love with the work of James Joyce, starting with Dubliners. and then Portrait and Ulysses, and which sounds somewhat ridiculous. I know because he's known as such a difficult author. I always read his works as very emotional on a, on the, with the characters on the on a kind of on the first level of reader or as a reader. And then secondly, it was so important for me because when you get to his more difficult books, especially as as a young person as I was you really get comfortable not understanding a lot of things. That was so critical for me when I then started seriously studying languages and seriously reading books in foreign languages. I started reading novels in Italian very quickly after I had started studying the language, and I never felt uncomfortable with the idea that I was missing a lot of things. And certainly my experience reading Ulysses as a, and rereading it several times as a 16-year-old, as a totally mad 16-year-old, put me, prepared me for just diving into to work that I knew I could only understand a, a piece of and then slowly but surely you gain more from it. And then... With Italian, one reason I think I fell in love with the language so much after beginning to study it is that I really did not know the authors at all. Some of them had come up through Joyce, of course, and through some other Anglophone authors, but I had read next to nothing, and many of the household literary names, you could say, in Italy, I had essentially never heard of. So it was like slowly discovering a whole world after I had started beginning to read in Italian. I started to read quite soon books by Moravia, who's not a particular favorite of mine now, I'll admit, and then into Spavo, Pirandello, obviously. And I had never read any of them before. So that feeling of discovery that I could now experience these authors who were just totally not on my mental map beforehand was really something was a, a great impetus for reading as much as I could in Italian. And that's what got me so comfortable speaking. I, I, when I first 
went to Bologna as an undergrad, I can't imagine what I spoke. I was like, I had was arrived and probably spoke like it was out, I was out of a Sfavo novel. It's like from the early 1900s. But again, that was all so important just for making, for getting comfortable with the language. Are you still, uh, you are associated with publishing? My love of publishing in itself is, has faded, <laughs> certainly. Not, I'm not as gung-ho about it as an industry as I used to be. Now I'm driven purely by a love of the books and the authors that I translate. I, I, have, I, I have no romanticized view of the industry anymore. Um, but it was good that I had it at, a, at an earlier stage in my life because it's such an impractical business to get into that you have to have some kind of, there has to be something that's pushing you to get into it, even if th those views are unsound. So this translation, did you get into any formal training program or anything before you started doing it or after you started, after you wanted to translate? Any mentoring or anything that you got? I did want, I did a course in college, but which still proves very helpful for me, some of the ideas that came up. In terms of practical training, for me, I really think of doing those samples that I was translating for publishers in Italy as a school. It, it really was a, a practical school because it was forcing me to do a lot of genres and different kinds of books that I never would have tried to do it anyway. Some of it was very commercial, mystery, thrillers, romance, to literary fiction. And that kind of work has also proved helpful for an extremely literary author like Michele Mari, but even though he's extremely literary, he plays with genres a great deal, and he believes mimicry is a huge part of what he does. He loves to take especially older authors who come from very disparate genres and mimic them and also sometimes put, put it all in a blender. His stories are this, his stories, You Bleeding Childhood, are this beautiful hodgepodge of all of these different literary influences and genre from his youth. So this was just to say that tapping into these various different voices and literary traditions, even where it's not where you'd expect to go necessarily as a translator was a helpful school. And I think it's good to, to force yourself sooner or later to do that kind of work, even if it's not being published. Now, introduce us to Michael Marie. You have already touched upon, but introduce us to Michael Marie, the writer. Speaking of household literary names, you could say as much as you can have a household literary name in Italy because readership is what it is. But Michele Mari is really one of, one of the giants of contemporary Italian literature in Italy. He started writing in the late 1980s. His first book came out in 1989 called Di Bestia in Bestia, which I would title from beast to beast in English, which is a very gothic, you could say Baroque novel in terms of style. And he's grown a reputation over time for mixing. I mean, on one hand, you have books that are very autobiographical and autofictional. And then on the other hand, you have this intense investment in the fantastic and in various literary genres, especially the more the, the more fantastic, the better, such as horror, speculative work in sci-fi, uh, mystery and adventure. And a lot of his work, especially a series of books that deals with his own childhood, actually marry these two things, the autobiographical and the autofictional and the fantastic, which for me is maybe the best introduction to his work. That's why I decided to start with these books, because I think they point to all of his other work, some of it which is more literary in a traditional sense. In he believes in, he speaks of a literary vampirism, where you take these older models and suck the blood out of them to recreate them. And some of his books do that in a more, I would not say conventional, but slightly more straightforward way. He has a novel which is very much like a 7th, 18th, or 19th century 
British adventure novel. Whereas then on the other hand, you have works that like Verdigree and You Bleeding Childhood in particular, really blend his own personal experiences with his experiences as a reader. And ultimately, you end up feeling for him, there's no difference between what he's experienced in his real life and what he's experienced on the page. And that's something that I find particularly gratifying, both as a translator and as a reader. Now, in your translator note, uh, you talked about the uh, influence of Poe and Kafka on his writing. So there are a lot of influences that come up on the page, and sometimes they speak literally. In the case of Poe, there's one story that I'll just mention called Eight Writers, where several authors, eight, unsurprisingly, are granted a speaking speaking role for a little bit. Uh, I will, uh, in, in that case, because young Mari, young uh, Michelino, is trying to discover who is ultimately the greatest maritime writer of, of all, after he's jumbled all of them into one single great writer in his head. We don't think of Poe principally as a maritime r- adventure writer, but that is his most famous, his only novel, as far as I know, is in that genre, and a couple of good stories too. But the quintessential Poe, the horror Poe, is very much a big influence in Mari's work. There are certain intense see where his work really does dive explicitly into the genre. Poe is very much present. And since Mari believes in this kind of literary mannerism, where you take older styles, sometimes intentionally antiquated, lexicons and in, inject that into the page, which of course, when he's writing about his own childhood can be very funny because it's a very strange contrast. It's not something most writers would do today. I, as a translator, tried to mimic that as much as possible. That was an interesting experience because a lot of these influences are, in fact, Anglophone. They wrote in English. And certain times this was like almost like the text could come home in a way. So I was reading a lot of these older influences on his work while translating You Bleeding Childhood, the story collection, and his novel Verdigree. And a lot of Poe's stories in particular. And sometimes I was literally just stealing things. I mean, I was stealing words. I was stealing expressions, which not in a kind of It wasn't so intentional, but sometimes they would get lodged in my brain. An old word that maybe Poe would use or an expression, which I would never put in my own writing or use in in day-to-day speech. Sometimes when working on this translation, it just felt right in the same way that that Mari will take something from Leopardi or something like that. He's really not afraid to use the antiquated. In fact, he uses it to heighten. He believes style and literary tradition can be a way of almost exalting the most horrible and traumatic experience of his own life and actually bring out the humor in them. So I was trying to do that in a similarly, not systematic, but let's just say natural and hopefully inspired manner that, that, he, did, that he brings to his own writing. Whether we works and comes through in the translation or not, I can't say. But if I'm reading it, some of these stories, I, I hear a voice in my head that it, I, I can recognize as very injected with a Poe-inflected voice. And that feels fitting to me. In terms of Kafka, I would say the mix of distress and anguish and humor You could see the surreal connections between Kafka and Mari and some of his other books, especially a book called Tutto il Ferro della Torre Eiffel, All the the Eye, Eiffel Tower, which is one of his more surreal books. I think as a reader, you could definitely draw a connection between the two writers. But in his stories, where I feel Kafka the most is actually in his in Mari's stories, that is, in his relation to his relationship with his father this really difficult relationship, which I was rem- always reminded of in some of Mari's stories about his own father, who was similarly a, I don't know if it's similarly not, but, but um, he, he was a frightening figure in a way for Mar- young Mari as a child, but also because he admired him so much. 
uh, his father was the famed industrial designer and artist Enzo Mari, and who has a huge influence on his work in different ways. But one story in particular called The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, which has this, it's just a conversation between the two of them, a dreams conversation. So already we're in Kafkaesque territory with this dream, this surreal setting. And on the page, the adult man just regressed back into this helpless child in front of his, with his father. And in a very funny way too, because it's all about these childhood toys. I don't really want to give away what happens in the story, but there's this terrible revelation about what his father has done over the years that brought me back to stories of Kafka's like The Judgment, where he realizes his father has been keeping, his father, who we thought was this essentially almost an invalid, you would say, this dying old man, he realizes he's actually been doing things behind his back and the narrator is just destroyed by this revelation. So there's something similar at play in this story by Mari without giving too much away. Though he takes, the humor for me goes to, I'm actually, I'm always a little hesitant to talk about it because when Michele says, like when he writes these stories, the humor isn't necessarily there for him while he's writing it, but then it's there after. And that's one of the beauty of, of literature. You can take these traumatic moments and really give them a new, a new life, a new way of looking at them. For And for a reader, too, that can be very cathartic, seeing the humor in their own relationships as well. Anyway, so that's a bit of a tangent. But without giving too much away, Kafka and Poe are there in sometimes very literal, thematic ways, but also in the voice. I, I obviously could not regurgitate Kafka on the page in the same way. It wouldn't feel as natural because it's all through translation. So that's not something I really attempted to do so much as I did with authors like Poe, Stevenson, Melville. There, it felt very direct because they were writing in language. So I was actually interested in stealing from their own lexicons. I didn't try to do that as much with authors like Kafka or Celine, for instance. That's another big influence because it would have been through translation. So as a part of translating uh, this uh, You Bleeding Childhood, right? Have you had to read some of these authors he has mentioned? Other than, of course, Poe and Kafka, Stevenson, you might have already read. I have a very Mari-like experience because Stevenson was that my dad wanted me to read Stevenson as a child, reading me Treasure Island, and I I just found it so boring. But I tried to read all of them, especially the eight writers of that story. The eight writers; those were that. That's maybe the best example of because they are giving speak. They're giving given speaking roles, and beyond that. There, it's the text is full of reference to references to their books, and some of these references are hidden. They're not actually in quotation marks. So I was looking at, I was catching these sentences that were had essentially been plucked from Pavese's translation of Moby Dick. And so then I was backtracking and I was plucking them from the original Melville. So reading all of these authors, being immersed in them, were very important and. The more I was working on the translation, and I also had was finding I had less time to be reading all of them as much as I'd like to, I started listening to more audiobooks than I usually do. And so I was listening to all of these eight writers, which include Stevenson, Conrad, Poe, etc., to get them in my head. And I was and I was living in Rome at the time when I was finishing this translation. And now if I think back at this apartment in Rome, I feel like I'm I was in a boat almost, in a ship. I was listening to so much maritime fiction. If I think about looking through the window onto this Roman courtyard, I was actually looking through the a hatchway or something. So yes, I, it, the obsessive quality of Mari's fiction, the way he obsesses about authors and various things in his life rubbed off on me and I did take a very, uh, somewhat obsessive to, to translating his work the title that uh, bleeding childhood what it is in like in italian is it the same one-on-one translation or title is something different yeah it's slightly different 
I think it is in this translation way, it's, it, this comes up always, it's somewhat less literal in a way that I think gets to the heart of it more. The, it's, the original is tu sanguinosa infantia. If you were going to translate that very literally, it would be you bloody childhood. Some would maybe even translate it as you gory childhood, something like that. There is this, the blood is there quite literally. There are a number of reasons why I made this adjustment. Uh, one of it is that bloody sounds too much like a euphemism for an, a, an expletive, essentially. Bleeding as well can be, there's a character in Verdigree who always uses in the translation bleeding to, like you would say, this damn so and so, this bleeding so and so, which I'm more familiar with through Irish speech patterns. I don't know how much it's used in America. I don't think it is at all. But bloody is a bit more universal. So that seemed a bit distracting. At the same time, it that seemed to keep it a bit on the surface, especially the idea of gory. It's that's not that's only one idea. Sure, there's violence in it. That's part of it. But I thought that what's really happening is it's going back to childhood as of the as this place of pain for one of course but it's also it just bleeds out it never ends childhood is this open wound in mari's work that never really heals but at the same time some of the stories it plays with this dynamic between adulthood and childhood especially the opener childhood for the narrator and for the writer when once he starts looking at these moments of childhood, it bleeds out and covers everything else. It, there's, it can't be confined. So these were elements of the book and of the original title that I thought would be lost with what some might cons consider a more literal translation. And I talked about it with him, that this has been something that's been really helpful throughout the process. You know, whenever I felt like things had to change to be actually closer to, to the original in a way, you know, paradoxically. That was something I could always talk about with him. That became very important for wordplay is very important in both of these books, especially in Verdigree. So that has often necessitated changes. And when you have a living author, that's great that you can talk to them about it. And in his case, he was always very open-minded and very honest about his opinions, but, which was great because if he said yes, that meant yes. I know he wasn't just saying so to be polite. <laughs> so that's the long story behind the title, which I thought was ultimately the most evocative option. Now we'll come to the stories. Uh, first one, of course, being the Black Arrow. Uh, I had to read it multiple times. First time when I read it, of course, it's about translation. I liked it because it's about translation. I'm interested in translation. And uh, probably this is the first story I'm reading about uh, the translation being the main theme in a short story. I don't know whether there are any other stories. That's the first part. Uh, the second part, uh, what I liked about it is uh, with the, the sentences, the prose is very, very dense. In fact, in the entire book, Mm, though it's about his childhood, his nostalgic memories, being a child and all, but the prose is very, very dense and uh, in certain sentences are very, very complex. You have to reread it to understand exactly what he's saying. But still, I felt uh, there is something that I am missing. You know, there is something more into the story. I understood that in the third read. I don't know whether I am right in assuming that or not. See, this basically this story is about translation and uh, he is comparing two different, uh, you know, translations, right? Probably different translators or edited translation, whichever you may say, which have been done uh, three decades apart. That kind of dichotomy in understanding these two different versions of translation, uh, it also appears in the way he feels about his father. So, finally, in the end, uh, I thought that actually the theme of translation, two different translation, is actually metaphor for his understanding of his father, what he means to him. Oh, that's fascinating. And I've also found that I've never read anything quite like it in a narrative form, certainly not in a short story for, form, that dra dramatized 
translation. It's the, the uh, to explain a bit. The narrator is a young Mari. He's just read this book by Stevenson, this adventure novel, The Black Arrow, and has loved it. And then his dad arrives. This is at this house in the country that his grandparents owned by uh, Lake, Ma Lake Maggiore, which comes up several times, in including in Verdigree. So his dad shows up. It's very out of the ordinary that his dad would come to visit them there. He doesn't, because this is his, this is his maternal grandparents. And very oddly arrives with a present, a gift, which is, lo and behold, Stephen says the Black Arrow, which is then a terrible thing because he doesn't want to admit that he's just read this book because if he admits to that, he'll ruin the surprise. And they, even though he's only nine, he already has this very tortured relationship with his father. So what ultimately happens after he's continued to really torment himself because of this, this, uh, this mistake that he's unwittingly made, he realizes, yes, that they are two editions. And not only that, they are two different translations. And he ends up, for what is the rest of the story, which is the majority of the story, comparing the first two sentences of, the, of these two translations, ultimately coming to the conclusion that they are two different worlds. He picks apart almost every word in these translations. And this sounds very dull if you explain it like that, but it's dramatized in such a way that he takes the influence again, of Stevenson, the Stevenson of gothic and adventure novels, and he in, injects that into a little boy looking at two sentences of two different translations, which is really startling for me. I always felt that way as a reader. And then I was terrified of translating it, of course, because it's so complicated by the fact that these are two translations from English. Michele has told me that these were two real editions in Italian. This was not, they were not invented. So, or, so translating it into English, you have to work backwards. See, these are basically two Italian translated versions of uh, Black Arrow, right? Exactly. They are real translations that, that Mari cites. They are real Italian translations. I actually asked him only recently if they were real or not, because I wasn't sure. So I had to translate them back into English. They had to be translated from Italian back into English. It became this game of meta-translation and a story that was all about translation. And they both had to then be, they had to be both somewhat similarly distant from Stevenson's original too, right? Because the idea of the story is that translation could almost go on infinitely. And in, in the English translation, that seems to happen literally, right? Because neither of them could be the right, ver you know, Stevenson's original, because they both had to be translation. So part of the game for me was also like seeing how they could both differ from the original. But then it's also, it was made even more complicated because it, of course, it had to follow the order of, and the rhythm of the of it, Mari's, as you can imagine. It was really complicated and it was important that they it all felt still very believable. These two sentences could be written as openers to a, a, an adventure novel. Ultimately, I'm, I'm pleased with it. I'm really gratified that you felt that it was something unique for you as a reader, too, because ultimately, with a lot of Mari's work, again, that's why I felt like it had to be translated, even though at first read, as a translator, I thought this is impossible. I can't translate back into English translations from English. That my own love of the work has given me a great deal of courage at times to make bolder decisions than I think I maybe always would for other books. But in a text that ultimately becomes an exploration of meta-translation, what are you going to do as a translator? You have to take risks. In terms of the reflection, the translation as a reflection of his father, that's really fascinating. And I'd love to hear more about your own opinion on it. It is true that everything, while the anal his literary analysis begins uh, half in the latter half of the story where he's looking at the text, even from the beginning when his father shows up, you could see that he is maybe translating everything that and reading into 
everything, every gesture, every word of his father, looking for deeper meaning. So in a way, the two things go hand in hand. It's ultimately interesting that literary connection with his father, you can see that this is Mari being born as a literary scholar and as a translator in this story after his father gives him this book, even though his father wanted him to follow in his footsteps and go into design and considered literature what he called frin frin, like silly business, essentially. Anyway, without giving too much away, with the, the, this idea of translation as this continual process, and if on the flip side of that is you will never make it to the original. You will, it will never arrive. It will go on forever, and that is something the story dramatizes. And he very subtly and very tragically, I believe, connects that to his father at the, in the last two sentences of the book. This idea that there, there will never be a, a, an arrival. You will ne- I, I won't say the, the final lines of the book, of the story, because I would like people to read it. But I do think it connects the two in a way that you noted from the beginning. Yeah, so I definitely agree. See, in every story, he talks about uh, uh, something what a child deals with. Like in the zigzag puzzle in one of the stories or whichever story you take. It starts with a childhood memory. But finally, when the story gets ended, he takes it to a whole different level. Almost to a metaphysical level, he takes it in almost all the stories. The reason I was not happy with my uh, second read that I know that there is something else beyond what I understand. I always felt that it is just about translation. But uh, when I was wondering whether it has got something to do with his father, right? whether it's a metaphor for his relation with father, I went back and checked the sentences that, that you translated. In almost every sentence, there is that ambivalence. You feel that he's too distant from his father, he's afraid of his father, or in the next half of the sentence, you feel that he's very close to his father, right? He's not able to decide. Same thing with the translation. These two are, you know, two different, uh, it gives a two different feels. Even the simple change of a word, right? It gives a totally a different meaning. Now, the other story is a couple of stories that I picked up. The other one is the soccer balls of Mr. Kars. Soccer Balls of Mr. Kars is also a very lovely story, but not as deep as the, you know, the Black Arrow, but it's a very entertaining and it is done in a very beautiful way. You tweeted that uh, it has been uh, selected for this O. Henry short story of the year. I think, I think it's coming in that compilation, O. Henry compilation. I guess I should say right away that those that story, as well as, the final story in the collection, Eurydice Had a Dog, were taken from a different collection of Mari, sto- of Mari stories, which the title story being Eurydice Had a Dog, uh, which came out before You Bleeding Childhood. I'm obviously speaking of the Italian uh, originals here. And since this, w- it's already hard to get to do one collection of stories in translation in, in English, in the Anglosphere. That's hard to be able to do and and the and the fact is that these stories had been out for decades and they'd never been translated the idea was also since there these two stories the soccer balls of mr kurtz and eurydice had a dog they explore the same themes as you bleeding childhood they're about childhood they're about also the almost you could say fetishistic collecting of items from childhood in this desperate and ultimately hopeless in a way attempt to to have time stop and, and and hold on to childhood in this very physical manner at the same time there's an idea of giving a more complete this was the first book coming out of mari's work in english we could give an even more complete view of his vision of his work and the second story in, of the two, Eurydice, was also important for the setting, which is the setting of Verdigree and Black Arrow. There were a number of reasons. Now, Kurtz also, I just think, if you were lo- looking at Mari, I love all of his stories, but I think Kurtz is the most, from a kind of classical, traditional viewpoint, one of his best. 
I just think that is such a great intro to his work. And so I, mo it's, I guess that was an intuition that thankfully wasn't just a personal bias because ultimately it then came out in the New Yorker and will be in this anthology. So <laughs> I'm very happy we, an we included it in, this, in the collection because otherwise that wouldn't have happened. At the same time, it dramatizes, I guess the story focuses on these boys, these little boys at a boarding school who are always kicking the sock. This is the only beautiful thing about this, to this horrid life at, this, at the school is their soccer matches, but they always end up kicking the ball over the wall where this horrifying man who they've never seen named Mr. Quartz ho keeps and hoards the balls and never sends them back over. And the protagonist imagines him as this giant, horrifying spider who sucks on the balls that fall like fat insects into his web. So it has this, it's pure Mari. It has this delightful childhood setting, which is injected with trauma and also horror to the um, degree until it becomes actually also very humorous. It, and it's also uh, imbued with antiquated language, poetic language in an Italian poetic tradition. So authors like Poe, they were very important for finding the voice in these stories. I think these stories, these two were actually the first that really clicked for me as a translator where I said, okay, oh, this is how I can make it work. This is Mari in English. This is how it could I don't know. I don't know what else to say about the story in a way because let's just say it has a big reveal, a big revelation at the end, a great twist. I think that also reveals why this book, this story is so important for Mari as a writer, and thematically why it's so important. I know that now he says that Kurtz, he essentially is Kurtz, which is it's just funny. I wonder when if he when he wrote it, it's an older story for him. He wrote it in the early nineties. I wonder if he probably originally related more to the children, but now he relates more to the scary old man behind the wall who's never actually seen. I don't know if there was anything that struck you in particular or why out of the collection you mentioned this one. You see, in the entire uh, book, all the stories, um, he has this uh, obsession with this memory, childhood memory, and he keeps on dissecting it. But uh, this is the story in which I felt that uh, uh, he is at peace with his memories. Almost he is, uh, you know, he identifies himself with uh, curse. So the curse also has the same fascination of keeping the memories intact. <laughs> Yes, I think it's, and it's the first time he really dramatizes this in his work. And that's why it has a special place for me, too. Before, before writing the stories, his books had been less overtly autobiographical. And I think you can see with this story, the direction he's going in. Not that he does it consistently afterwards, but it's one of the first time he moves in that direction. And... Yes, without giving away the details of what happened, Kurtz represents this figure who creates a museum of his own pa of the past and of childhood, and that has become one of the major themes throughout Mari's work in general. So I do think the story is an important key, and that's one reason we decided to why I proposed originally to tack on this story as well as the other one at the end of the collection as two bonus tracks. Who doesn't like that? I did have to do a lot of research into soccer, though. So I'm just like totally, I'm totally ignorant about sports in general. So that was, I think, I think one of the most important stories to actually have a, a, an editor friend who, who knows better than me, have him read it and help me with the sports terminology. That was very important for this one. I felt very comfortable, like talking about 19th century whaling through Melville, but soccer was really alien to me. I guess that's one reason I believe so adamantly that this, it's a beautiful story. For translation, we're talking about the Black Era, which is about translation. I, I'm sold from the beginning, but it's because I have no interest in soccer that I could actually find that story so moving and actually relatable. It speaks to the power of Mari's writing. Now we'll move on to Verdigris. Please introduce us to Verdigris before we end the conversation. 
it goes back to again that house in the country where we were just talking about with Eurydice had a dog and the black arrow and you have a 13 year old Michelino a 13 year old Mari is the auto fictional protagonist where he realizes that the farm the rather gardener and general handyman who works for his grandparents is losing his memory while he spends usually his summers bored, not knowing what to do, and for that reason, diving into literary works of Stevenson and whatnot. Th this one particular summer, he ends up spending his time trying to help Felice, that's the name of this old gardener, piece his memory back together. And he does this originally by helping with mnemonic devices, essentially. And this is where the wordplay usually comes out. For instance, to think of, there, there's so many that it's hard to, it starts with his name. For instance, Felice, who speaks in a dialect in the original, pronounces his own name, Felice. When the translation, Michelino grabs a plant, he hands him a fleece flower and says, when you forget your name, you forget your name, look at the fleece, look at the fleece and think Felice. It almost sounds exactly the same. That involved a, uh, a lot of obviously slight sh shifts in the translation. But as he starts to piece this past back together, he realizes that there's a whole mystery surrounding Felice's past and the past of his own house, which turns increasingly gothic as the book goes on. And Michelino is, becomes essentially a little Sherlock Holmes. And it ends up concerning uh, fascism, uh, the Nazi occupation of Italy, the, the partisan resistance, but also this strange um, shady Russian family of nobles who used to own the house before his grandparents bought it, who fled the Soviet revolution. In a sense, history comes to life all around him in the form of nightmare. Uh, Mar young Michelino, being a fan of Gothic novels, is actually thrilled about though he progressively gets the feeling that he's maybe getting in way over his head as the book goes on. It's a really, if the stories in You Bleeding Childhood highlight the various genres in, I guess you have micro doses of them that Mari loved growing up, Third Degree really recreates it on a page. It's one of the, I, it be, and even though it's very literary and, and has again a kind of complex lexicon it, to it. It is one of, for me, it was one of the most gripping page turners I ever read. It is for me the most gripping Italian novel I've ever read. When I read it the first time, I could not put it down. And that is despite one of the protagonists, Felice, speaking in a dialect, and it is a different language compared to Italian. It's so anyway, I don't want to give too much away because I because I found it an extremely engaging mystery, the book. I don't want to give it too much away since you're just starting it. And I'm very curious to hear what you think. Like the Black Arrow, there it involved, you know, taking some extreme choices <laughs> just to make it live on the page the way it does in the original, especially because of the wordplay. Really wonderful work, wonderful translation, and thank you for this uh, lovely conversation. Thank you. It's really a joy to talk to someone who's also now appreciates Mari. So I, more than it, principally, I start from the position of fan, and then I'm translation, I'm translator second. So it's always delight, delightful for me, really, to talk about his work with someone who's enjoyed the stories. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for the session. Thank you very much.